Welcome to The Mission Matters. The Mission Matters is a partnership between 1615 and Missio Nexus, who have a shared passion to mobilize God's people to be a part of His mission. The Mission Matters is hosted by Matthew Ellison, President of 1615, and Ted Esler, President of Missio Nexus. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Today's episode is sponsored by Support Raising Solutions. Support Raising Solutions is a Christian ministry that serves the body of Christ around the world to provide biblical and practical training on how to raise your support and launch your ministry. They desire to flood the nations with great commission workers who are spiritually healthy, vision-driven, and fully funded. And now, here are your hosts, Matthew Ellison and Ted Esler. Well, hello and welcome once again to the Mission Matters podcast. I am Matthew Ellison, and as always, I am joined by my good friend and co-host, Ted Esler. Ted, how's it going, my brother? It's going well. It's going well. It's not snowing here in Florida, so it's going real well. Yeah, it's always good to see you, my friend. So we're not sure when this is going to air. We have a couple in the can, but last week we had snowmageddon in uh, the United States, particularly in the central United States, and so it got me thinking about the coldest temperatures I've ever experienced. I was in Great Falls, Montana, working with the church and a storm front came in. And I think on the way to the airport, the morning I was leaving, it was negative 32 degrees. Now this was not wind chill, okay? This was a straight up negative 32. It was probably negative 50 with wind chill. And I wasn't prepared even though I addressed warmly, but it was bone chilling. And on the news, they said, make sure you cover your mouth when you're outside because the cold is so extreme, you could damage your lungs. Mm. So that's my top cold or my lowest temperature, I should say. How about you, Ted? Well, I am from Minnesota. And um, one time our family took a little vacation. It was like the second week of January. We went up to very the very northern part of Minnesota, the very northern part of Minnesota and stayed at a camp that was actually closed down for everybody else they opened it up just so our family could stay there and it was the kind of temperatures you're talking I don't think we ever really found out exactly how cold it was because it was pretty remote but what I'll what I what I remember and what I miss from Minnesota is when it gets super cold the snow squeaks when you walk on it and there's a certain kind of smell in the air and uh, Mm -hmm. I actually do miss that uh, for my days um, so we're going to ask James, uh, who's on our call, to answer the same question. Coldest temperature? Well, you guys have me beat uh, by far. Um, <clears throat> I've rarely experienced temperatures below zero, but I, uh, for a while I lived in Colorado, and this was uh, in my pre-seminary days, and I was a pest control technician. And it was middle of the winter, and um, I was walking around a big warehouse checking mouse traps. And uh, my boss called, this is back in the day. Do you remember the, the brick uh, cell phones that were like this big? And my boss called me and I took my glove off my hand and I answered the phone and I wasn't on the phone more than a minute, uh, two minutes at most. And my hand was so frozen cold and in, in deep pain after that. And then I learned it was, it was about 20 below with the wind and the wind was blowing real hard and everything. And I, I had an ungloved hand for a little while, uh, so that was the worst, but uh, yeah, not like uh, Minnesota for sure. I, I once had a car that I left sit for a few weeks over the coldest part of the year, and I got in that car to drive it, and one of the tires actually cracked. Wow. It was so hardened and cold. Now it's probably a tire that should have been changed long ago. But anyway, <laughs> well, our, our guest today is James Mason, and we're going to be talking about perspectives. And uh, I want to start, James, if you could just tell us a little bit about who you are and just um, I, on Reddit, if you've ever seen the explain to me like I'm five uh, topics that they do, <laughs> explain to us like we're five, what perspectives is after you tell us a little bit about who you are. Okay, sure, sure. Well, uh, my name is James Mason. Um, I, uh, I'm the CEO of Perspectives USA, and I'll, I'll distinguish uh, Perspectives USA from the rest of the Perspectives movement. Uh, in a little bit, but um, yeah, I served as a, a pastor for about 12 years, and, uh, and then I served in uh, mission recruiting. I had my own kind of uh, awakening, I guess, to God's global purposes, and shifted my career to uh, to mission mobilization. 
uh, still love the church and, and, and uh, find, found a ministry that actually I could still be involved with churches in, in serving through perspectives. So it's been a real joy. And then in these last eight years, I've been serving in perspectives. Uh, perspectives is, uh, let me give you a, a few little uh, uh, points here because pers perspectives is a broad term these days, but uh, perspectives fundamentally is a course. So it's a 15 lesson course. And uh, I'll describe that in just a second about what the course is. But Perspectives is also an organization. And in my context, uh, we are Perspectives USA, the Perspectives Study Program, Perspectives USA, which is focused on mobilization through education. And then there's a broader Perspectives movement, which is a, a movement globally that is focusing on reproducing movements of locally based mobilization. Um, and Perspectives is really a movement within a movement, right? Within the frontier mission movement. So we, are, we see ourselves as a part of the family of the, the missions movement that uh, really aims to see God's purposes fulfilled within every people. Um, but in terms of perspectives, our, our fundamental identity, I guess you could say, is that we, are a, we, we manage a 15-lesson uh, course, and it's structured around four vantage points or perspectives. So the perspectives name comes from these four vantage points. There's a biblical uh, view, an, a historical view, a cultural view, and a strategic view or perspective through which we observe God accomplishing his global purpose. So that's what we revolve the, our lessons around. And it's really uh, 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 accompanied, the, the course is accompanied by a, a, a reader, a big fat uh, dynamic uh, reader with a lot of articles, 170 different articles uh, written by over 150 different mission uh, professionals and practitioners. And, uh, and then what we do is we utilize local uh, coordinators or volunteer teams throughout the country uh, to provide a class experience uh, in community where believers are invited to uh, strategically labor with Christ as he fulfills his, uh, his, per his, his ancient promises. And so uh, that's a, a key feature of Perspectives is that we use live uh, instruction uh, we use 15 different instructors, so one per lesson. We bring in a different um, um, a, a le mission professional for each of the 15 lessons. And, uh, and then we offer the course at some different levels, certificate and credit, uh, for example. And uh, really what we're after is by the end of the course, we want students to have a clear perspective of God and of his mission in the world. And it's through this clearer perspective, which enables a person to make informed decisions, uh, strategically informed decisions about their lives, uh, how they can live in their, their lifestyle, their relationships, which in turn uh, leads them to their strategic participation in the fulfillment of God's global purpose, uh, world evangelization. So it's just a real privilege to be a part of that. So I'm going to give a plug for perspectives here. I know Ted is going to give his own perfect, uh, perspective story, excuse me, in just a moment. But 1615 has been mobilizing churches for about 16 years. And when we come into a church to help them really clarify vision and strategy, we start with a discovery workshop. And James, you know about that workshop because your church participated in our coaching process. But there's a question I ask, how did you arrive at a place where you decided to bring your church and missions leaders together and say, let's reassess how we're doing missions. And I will tell you, invariably, someone says perspectives. We went to the perspectives course. It changed our thinking. And we realized as a church that we were missing it, that we were not in alignment with God. So I just want to say thank you for, uh, for perspectives, because we are beneficiaries of your work. You're creating coaching opportunities for us. So uh, how many people have been a part of the PSP program? Uh, for those of you who are new to this perspective study program uh, and how widespread is its use, James? Sure. Well, in the United States, we've, uh, net, we're now close to about 200,000 uh, alumni who have, who have completed the course uh, over the last 45 plus years. We're, we're coming up on our 50th, 50th anniversary in uh, 2024. So we're looking forward to celebrating that. But um, up to this point, we're at about 200,000 alumni um, I'm not exactly sure of the global statistics, but I think it's around 80,000 uh, additional alumni around the world who have uh, gone through the course. And in the US, we have about 8,000 students a year, uh, about 230 classes. I was just checking this out recently. Uh, I think we're at close to a total number of about 5,000 classes 
um, that, that Perspectives has run in the U.S. Uh, during our, our history. Uh, Perspectives is translated into nine different languages. Uh, and we just finished uh, the, the French translation. So we're really looking forward to uh, what kind of breakthrough and mobilization we can see in uh, places like Francophone Africa, where there are millions and millions of followers of Jesus who, um, who uh, love their neighbors and want to see the gospel extended to uh, the, the unreached around them and, and in other parts of the world. So that's really exciting. Perspectives classes are run in, in over 30 countries around the world. And um, doesn't mean that they all have strong uh, uh, national study programs or formal programs. Uh, uh, we call them emerging programs. Uh, some of them do. So I'm, I'm not sure the numbers there, uh, certainly more than half have a, uh, a, a steady national study program where they're running classes year after year after year in growing fashion. Uh, some of them are accelerating uh, like crazy, like Brazil. Uh, Brazil has an explosive perspectives movement right now and is a, probably the, the, the fastest growing um, national program in the world. Uh, but all of these programs are colleague programs of one another and the U.S. participates in that network. So in 1988, I took the perspectives course. <clears throat> I took it in Minneapolis. And, uh, you know, one of the first lessons that you get is the story of his glory. And uh, in that class that I took, we had this unknown Baptist pastor uh, teach that. It happened to be John Piper. And uh, that was really the beginning of our, you know, Great Commission, global Great Commission journey for my wife and I. Wonderful. And the impact for, on us was huge as it rolled out. Uh, when you talk about mobilization, um, just talk a little bit about why mobilization is important. I think a lot of people... Yeah understand how church planning, discipleship, and evangelism are big parts of the missionary cause. Tell us about mobilization. Yeah, um, mobilization is a growing term, um, and it has really grown over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, but uh, mobilization, in essence, if I were to really boil it down, is just helping God's people move with God in his mission. It's getting, getting God's people mobile. Um, and mobilization takes different forms. Um, there's a mobilization that, for example, is recruiting, just getting more individuals involved in, in mission or with mission agencies. Uh, there's also, uh, which I sometimes refer to as apostolic mobilization, getting, getting new things started, getting people in place, training individuals for service, training them in uh, a language learning or cultural engagement or what have you. Uh, there's another type of mobilization, which is, uh, pastoral, uh, which is the, the ministry of encouraging people, walking with them in their personal journey, uh, challenging them in areas of their life that they need to be challenged so that they're serving Christ well in their lives. Uh, it's the, the mobilization through encouragement. Um, and I think both of those are essential. Uh, and then there is another type of mobilization, which I refer to as a prophetic mobilization. Um, mobilization, which is awakening people to the revelation of God's purpose. Uh, understanding biblically um, what God is doing, uh, what he's about, what his heart is, um, educating about God and his purpose, also revealing uh, of how God has been demonstrating his purpose in, in history. Not just It's not just a biblical theology, but it's a demonstration that God is actively uh, fulfilling his purpose in the earth. And we can observe that in time. We can, we can imagine it within people groups uh, that don't yet have access. Uh, we can describe how transformation has happened within different people groups. And all together, it kind of creates a, a narrative, of a, a, a revelatory narrative that people need to understand. This is what God is really doing. And once they encounter that, then there's a, a transformation. or We sometimes refer to it as a paradigm change. I, when I first uh, went through the Perspectives course and uh, just in the few years uh, after uh, taking it myself is 2002. Um, I had people asking me, well, what was the impact? And all I could say was, it's sort of like having a brain transplant uh, for me. It was just a, a reversal of, of mentality and heart uh, as I encountered God in the, script, in the scriptures mm -hmm. uh, in a way that, that, um, that understood him in light of his mission. 
Uh, and that's a profoundly relational encounter. It's not just a, a mission statistics and information. Uh, this is aligning the, the life to the life of Christ in what he's doing in the world. So it's deeply, deeply relational and transformational. So that's what I mean by mobilization, at least in our context, there's, there's this recruiting type of mobilization, this equipping for mission, there's this pastoral nurture that comes alongside and they're integrated, you know, there's, there's, they're not all in neat boxes, but perspective's niche really is in that prophetic voice, that revelatory voice in helping people encounter uh, the scriptures and what God is doing in the world. James, I've talked to many pastors over the years who've been through the PSP program and they say, how come I never heard this stuff at seminary? <laughs> Why wasn't I taught at Bible college yeah. about this master story, the meta narrative? I, I heard all the subplots. They yeah. taught me about the sub stories but I miss the larger story of what God is up to. Maybe you could address that. How is it possible? And I'm not asking you to be hypercritical. I yeah, know <laughs> sure, areas. sure. I know you love Bible colleges. Yeah. But how are we graduating people out of institutions, spiritual institutions that teach the Bible yeah. and they miss the main story? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You know, um, our, our, our founder, the, the, the one who really had the idea for the Perspectives course, Ralph Winner, used to speak of uh, a disintegrated uh, education, uh, theological education in the United States, where a lot of our institutions compartmentalize the pieces. So you have biblical theology as a, as a, a niche, you have missions you know, as a niche, you have pastoral ministry as a niche, church history, what have you. And so we become uh, subject matter experts in those things. But the integration of God's story is sometimes missed in that kind of a process. So um, it's we're, we're, we're not hanging on to an overarching narrative, uh, a, a framework of God work at work in the world. And really all of those disciplines need to be worked through the framework of what God is doing versus it just being another academic uh, piece of subject matter. But uh, we live in a very utilitarian society as well, where um, success is dependent on how well we can articulate a, a, you know, a segment of theology or how well we can uh, um, grow a church or how many small groups we have in our church or how much uh, money we're sending overseas or something like that. Um, and and there's, there's nothing wrong with those, those pieces. But if we're not creating those, uh, if we're not understanding those elements in the context of a broader framework of God's mission, then we're usually you know, uh, falling into the trap of, of success models that uh, if we're, if we're honest, may be a little bit more about some of our own credibility in ministry or our ministry's credibility and may or may not be really aligned with what God is uh, trying to complete in the world. So I have a soft spot for, you know, for churches and for, for the church, you know, this is just discipleship. Um, we don't, uh, sometimes those of us in mobilization get a little angry why don't they get this? Why is the church, you know, people take perspectives, students will take perspectives and they'll say, why is my church, you know, so clueless on, on God's global purposes. But uh, what I like to remind people is that mobilization in essence is discipleship. It's helping people learn to follow Jesus and, um, and uh, following Jesus as a global Messiah. Right. And that takes a little bit of grace and patience. Um, when, when people uh, are growing in Christ, um, we, the scripture exhorts us to be patient and to walk alongside and journey with them in that. And I see that that's what mobilization in essence is, is. it's walking alongside the church, the, the body of Christ and nurturing them towards Christ. So in that context, um, as frustrating as it can be, um, I, I don't want to stay angry for very long or frustrated for very long. Cause I just want, I, I just, I just want to help people. follow Jesus. You know, I don't know if you've ever, seen the old book by Henrietta Mears, Unity of the Bible? I have not. So it came out of Southern California. She influenced a lot of leaders following uh, that, you know, they were in that post-World War II generation in, in that arena of that area that you're living in around Pasadena and whatnot. And I, ha I have a feeling that, um, you know, Ralph Winter was influenced by this concept of the unity of the Bible, 
we tend to like systematic theology or topical mm -hmm. Bible mm -hmm. um, approaches. So, you know, I really resonate with what you're saying. And, I, and that's why I mentioned earlier that that session, the story of his glory to me yeah. is maybe the most impactful of all of the, the sessions and perspectives because it opens your eyes of the great, you know, to the great commission from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. Absolutely. And we, and we really want to make sure we launch that way. You know, when, when we start the, the core, when, when the, in the first lessons, um, one of the things that I think uh, for Ralph Winter uh, and um, many others, uh, even before him, uh, Walter Kaiser, the Old Testament theologian and other since, um, understand that there is a, a, a missional unity to the Bible that we see revealed right at the beginning. Right. And so with the with the calling of Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, um, one of the terminology, uh, a phrase we use in perspectives is that God's promise reveals his purpose. Right. So we see we can see that God makes a promise to Abraham. I, I promise to, to bless you and that you will be a blessing. But it's a revelation of purpose. Right. That God expects his people to enjoy and participate in. Uh, as he completes his task. And so that is that unifying thread. We really do see a connection between the Abrahamic promise uh, and, and, and revelation of purpose and the Great Commission. And then the whole narrative of scripture is really uh, um, a tie, is, is tied to those, uh, to that revelation of what God says, this is what I intend to complete. This is what I intend to see come about in all the earth. And Abraham, you're going to be blessed as you do that, but you will be a blessing. I'm going to complete my purposes. So that's that unity. And I think that was what uh, was maybe that aha moment for Ralph Winter was, was um, an, a, an awakening, if you will, to the Abrahamic covenant. Um, I think Walter Kaiser was influential in that process and, and, and others. Um, and certainly his time in Fuller. And, and also uh, he had hundreds and hundreds of students who were coming through his uh, class at Fuller who were coming from different uh, parts of the world serving uh, among the unreached. And he was recognizing uh, these people are, are uh, working in places where there is no church, right? Where there is no um, culturally relevant expression of the gospel. And so how do we piece all of that together? And so all those disciplines can, can, can be tied together, whether it's theology or mission practice um, or, or church praxis, uh, can be understood in light of God's purpose. In my daily devotional today, I was just reading uh, about the road to Emmaus and how Jesus took, you know, took them through the whole history. And uh, that is that is a, a, a just a piece that I think uh, we often are ignorant to in the yeah. Western Church. So good. Yeah, and there was that awakening, right? The, yeah. Their eyes were their finally eyes were, open to exactly. see all that God had been doing. Yeah, yeah that's a beautiful, yeah. a beautiful yeah. picture. And then, of course, we've talked about this many times, James, Ted, as well, but the consummation of the church in Revelation 7. It's yeah. consummated in a global context. So that's the end to which all of history is moving. So the question has to be for churches is how do I align my local life and labor with that invincible eternal yeah. global purpose absolutely hey james let's get practical now mm -hmm. impact has certainly changed the way we all do ministry and i'm mm -hmm. curious with a 15-week study program and as you mentioned live presenters that's one of the value <laughs> yeah. propositions of perspectives what does perspectives look like in a covid era and now i would say post covid as the sure. vaccine starts to have its way yeah, well, those are those are questions that I think we're still, you know, going to wrestle with for some time. It's uh, um, the effect on our, our entire society and our church culture and everything are have, have still to be determined. Uh, certainly, in the short run, COVID has impacted us enormously. Um, COVID hit in the middle of our spring semester, which is our our biggest um, class semester, our, our you know the the biggest volume for us, and uh, we were so um, thankful that we were able to transition every single one of our classes into a Zoom environment, right? And all of our instructors kind of stepped up and sometimes beyond their comfort zone, you know, continued to provide instruction in a virtual environment. And all of our classes uh, were able to finish uh, the semester. And so uh, we were grateful for that, but it has had a big impact. Um, for the most part, my 
my observation is that these, these volunteer mobilizers, uh, the students themselves, certainly the churches, the passion is to gather. You know, the passion is to be together and to have a community experience of learning and discipleship. And um, we have seen a 60% reduction um, in our classes as a result of COVID. So fall was a big downturn. Um, and then uh, this spring, you know, is a little less so, but it's, it's still probably 50% of what we normally would do, you know, in the spring semester. So we took a huge hit uh, this year in terms of just the number of classes. Um, it, it, we had to cancel our national conference, which we had been planning. And we thought we'd delay it a year and then we ended up canceling it again because COVID was going longer than we thought it would. And so uh, it's, it's had some um, sad effects on us. But, you know, at this point, I think we're still very hopeful. Uh, there's some good things that have happened from this. Uh, first of all, I think we're maybe more convinced that we don't want to do a major shift away from delivering classes, that that is, we, we believe that things will begin to change. I think people want to be together. Um, all of our coordinators certainly want to coordinate live classes uh, or in-person classes. Um, but um, we want people to gather in dynamic learning environments and assist them in encountering uh, God's global purposes. And when we can do that in a more pronounced way, we will. And when, while we can't do that, we'll still work to mobilize the best we can in virtual environments. And we have the technologies to do that now. We can run Zoom classes. Um, we've piloted a, a national virtual class, which is live instructors, but people can register from all over the place. Um, one of our models that's important to us is that local mobilization. We want mobilizers to get to know their communities well, the local churches that they work with. And so just to put everything online and to say, hey, anyone that wants to can register for a class anywhere, uh, that sounds uh, nice and accessible, but it takes away that, uh, that drive for our, our, our deliberate and strategic work uh, in, in the relationships of the community. And so we're looking forward to, you know, we, we want to stay with that. We really do want to continue to build relationships with people on a local level. Um, I, I think another, another thing that's actually really been awesome, um, we, the, the, the COVID, uh, uh, the launch of COVID, I guess you could call it, in the spring, launched prayer for us. Uh, we really pressed into daily prayer for months. Uh, as a leadership team, we started gathering leaders virtually, you know, in prayer. Uh, and that is that's settled into a really powerful weekly prayer meeting now of all of our leaders. Uh, we're, we're doing some quarterly gatherings now just for prayer. Um, and so uh, I'm really grateful that that uh, it took a little bit of a nudge there to, uh, to, to for us to be a little more deliberate and to recognize our dependency on God which is one of our organizational values. We're dependent on God for, for this whole endeavor. So um, we're also, you know, strengthened our technology and our, our Zoom environment. So we can run those classes and we do have an online class. We had one before uh, COVID hit and we'll continue to grow and, and press those out. But we really do believe that at some point we'll be back uh, in the community uh, with, with in-person classes as well. So obviously perspectives.org is the best way for people to find a class. Is that is that still yeah, true? if you go to perspectives.org and click on the on the map and your uh, where your state is, you can see what classes are available there. You can also check for the uh, the online classes. We launch at least one online class every single month, uh, so that people can, if you don't have a class locally available, you can still uh, register for a class there. There's also some intensives um, uh, that that happen in the summertime and so on. I'm not sure how those will go for this summer. We'll have to kind of see, you know, what the environment is like, but. Yeah, I think we, we have a lot of optimism that, um, that things will start to pick up for us again. How, how about other ways to get involved? Let's say you've taken the class. You know, let's say it was a great class for yeah. you, but you know, you're not going to go overseas as a missionary. What are the other ways they can get involved? Sure, sure. Well, uh, let, me, let me back up a little bit. Um, do we have, do we, what, what's our time frame here? Do we have a little bit of time to, you yeah. asked another question sure. uh, that I felt like I didn't answer. You kind of asked me a hard question, Matthew, about uh, how do we feel about a 15 lesson course, you know, uh, and is our society, can our society handle that anymore? Uh, can I address that just a little bit? Um, Absolutely. I think there's something, something uh, really substantial to the question. 
Um, and I want to give some, some thought to that. And, and I think that also helps answer what our methodology is and what our future is and what we're working on. Um, I do think it's a challenge. I do think it's a challenge for uh, American Christians to sign up and register for a, a 15 uh, lesson course that, that takes a, a whole semester, or, you know, three, three or four months to do. Uh, by the way, it's not as challenging or um, to get people in other countries to sign up for something like that, by the way. They're starving for things like that. But in the, in, in the United States, it is, it is somewhat of a challenge. Um, but I, I think it's a challenge that the church needs. Um, we live in a content distribution world where there's a lot of bullet points and a lot of sound bites that go out there. And we need to do some of that. We, that helps us uh, put, put uh, the message out there. Um, but sometimes sound bites are, are polarizing and sometimes they don't allow us to, uh, to, to find any uh, depth of meaning. In, in content. And so um, we, we feel like we have a pretty solid and, and substantial message uh, and a, a paradigmic framework, if you will, that is all the more valuable to the church. And so um, we, we want to continue to support the church's ability to engage a, 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 a framework that has an integrity to it. And just if we were just to kind of shorten that down, we feel like we would, we want it to be as short as it could, we can possibly tell that story. Um, but um, we, we feel like there's a substantial um, a paradigm to convey. And we want to do that in an education process. So we're not just in the content distribution business. We really want people to gather together and, and wrestle through uh, this paradigmic framework. We want to provide an educational experience uh, which is um, not just, for example, hearing speakers, you know, or like, like, we're, like we're a platform for a, an event, but that we're engaging in an education and a learning environment. And so um, we feel like we have work to do to improve how we do that. But it's not to move away from the content base uh, that has some substance to it. It's, it's on us to improve how we educate and how we engage in the community. Um, remember also our uh, model is dependent on a reproduction of classes, uh, not just on, again, distribution that might go viral, but we want a model of ministry where we're empowering leaders to deliver, to, to, to strategically um, see about launching another class and, and engaging people in word of mouth and relationship and drawing people to uh, this important message. So that model is important to us. And um, the, our course framework um, also enhances our ability to carry out that kind of reproduction uh, of leadership. And we really feel like this, uh, this message is, um, has an integrity to it that we want to steward. And that doesn't mean that we're not constantly, how can we tell the story better? How can we engage it better? How can we find new voices to participate? Um, and then there's a lot of improvements that, uh, is, that is in our future. And, and maybe this will help answer the your question, Ted, which is how can people be involved um, to kind of uh, indicate a little bit of what we're working on right now. And this is, um, I believe, and I feel very optimistic uh, for our future, for our growth. Uh, by the way, Perspectives has grown fairly steadily through all of its history. We've been a little bit stagnant for the past uh, few years, but we've never been in really decline. We've always held a pretty steady uh, pattern of the number of classes. And, uh, you know, in some ways I find encouragement that maybe we go farther with fewer, it, it, you know, that because year after year after year, we're able to, to deliver a course to the body of Christ. Um, uh, that impact then has ripples that are maybe more important to us than just our own, our own growth as long as that voice is there and that we're stewarding that content. Uh, but some things we're working on, we're working on uh, new languages uh, in the United States. We have, you know, uh, the United States is the second largest Spanish speaking country in the world and millions and millions of believers in Jesus um, who are Spanish speakers. And we have huge opportunity to, multiply the number of classes in uh, Spanish and other demographics. Uh, we, we're focusing on Chinese uh, class development right now. Um, we have opportunity in demographics that we haven't traditionally be a, been a part of, the African-American church. 
we're seeing some real momentum uh, in some of our regions in the African-American community. Um, there are entire cities in the United States, large cities that have never had a prospectus course, uh, which is surprising, but, but it's there. As, as, as prevalent as we've been, there are plenty of communities, uh, towns, cities um, that have yet to experience um, the content. So there's a lot for us to do. We have an intentional strategy to multiply leaders in perspectives throughout the country. Um, one of the things we're working on right now is to uh, have more, for example, regional directors so that they don't have such a huge ge geography, each one of them to, 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 to focus on, but a smaller footprint, more leaders, so that they in turn can uh, raise up additional leaders in their areas. And just the principle of a span of care that even Jesus followed, you, that we all, you know, we shouldn't try to supervise more than, uh, more than we can handle. Jesus had, had 12 followers that he was really invested in. And sometimes Christian leaders think we can have 40 or 50 uh, and it's just not healthy. So we're really trying to work on our span of care, which we believe will multiply leadership and then multiply classes. So many other things, there's technology, you know, that we're working on. Um, if you look at our website for 30 seconds, you'll, you'll know that we need a new website and that's coming real soon. Um, I'm excited about, I'm not going to announce any dates, but um, <laughs> our, our, uh, our technology is really being worked on right now. And we've really been um, catching up on, on some deferred maintenance there. Uh, we've invested very heavily in that. And so we feel like there's great opportunity for us to continue mobilizing um, in all kinds of different areas of, of ministry, uh, focusing on, on people, on demographics, on, on, uh, uh, an improvement in our technology and our voice. So uh, our best days are, are really are in front of us. So at the end of Psalm 90, Moses says, may God establish and bless the work of our hands. Yes, <clears throat> establish the work of our hands. And I know that's my prayer. I know Ted has it as well. Um, I've been personally impacted by perspectives. Ted mentioned he has, and I've met countless others around the United States who say my journey into the heart of God and into the mission of God was really confirmed or maybe initiated at a perspectives class. So God speed to you guys. Uh, mm -hmm. You were talking about the integrity of the course and something popped into my head. It's a phrase we use at 1615 a lot. And that is that knowing comes before doing mm -hmm. and it shapes and informs the doing. And yeah. there's a lot of churches, and I don't mean this as a browbeat, but they're, mm -hmm. they're not doing missions well because they've not thought about missions well. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say the perspective study program has poor thinking about missions in its crosshairs, right? A lot of our <laughs> yeah. missiological behaviors are driven by half-truths, assumptions, um, sometimes outright myths. And I think we need to get back to the scriptures yeah. and allow God to shape our understanding of his mission and perspectives is a great way to do that. So we're yeah. behind and you. We, we're cheering. And we you guys want, and we want to be, we want to be alongside our brothers and sisters in that, you know, it's, it can be an overwhelming task uh, to think of the, think of the task of a pastor to disciple, you know, their, their entire body uh, towards uh, following Jesus. Well, you know, and we're just alongside and trying to help do that. Um, and we, we, we kind of come and go, we don't, we're, we're not um, stealing people away from, from churches. We want people to stay in their churches and serve him well. Um, but we want to provide a, a message of, of orientation to God and his purpose. Um, you, you, you asked uh, about uh, people's involvement. Um, we, the, the thing we always need the most is coordinators. We need people who are willing to invest uh, kind of a year of their life to, to mobilize in their community and to become a, uh, a class coordinator. And they can uh, find our regional director on our website and start that discussion there. But we're also adding a lot of staff right now. We're, we're looking for people who have technical skills in uh, uh, whether it's in communications, graphics, video. Uh, we need uh, operational people, people, uh, finance, uh, administration people. So there's all kinds of roles and perspectives. We manage uh, several thousand volunteers um, every year, and it takes a lot of organizational kind of behind the scenes stuff. Um, we have a, a database with hundreds of instructors that we want to steward well and um, steward those relationships well. We have agency partners. Uh, we have an alumni that we want to relate to uh, with thousands of people that we want to help serve them as they continue their journey. 
So there's all kinds of roles and, and people can go to our website and uh, find, find some opportunities there. Well, great. Uh, well, James, thanks for being with us today. Uh, I, I want to thank you uh, for, for inviting me today. It's a, been a real privilege. And, uh, you know, Matthew, I've known you for, uh, I don't know how many years now, 10 or 15 years, something like that. And it's been a real privilege uh, partnering with you in mobilization. And I love that one-two punch of uh, providing education, but also uh, the guidance and, and the strategic planning uh, that 1615 provides. And I uh, love the insights and the conversations that you guys are stoking. Uh, and it's been real helpful uh, for all of us. So hopefully we're, we're raising the water, you know, for, for the whole family of, of uh, frontier mission workers and mobilizers. Now is the time in the show when we talk about something you like. What is it today? Okay, well, I, I promise I won't do too many book recommendations and these some things you like, but I am listening to a book right now that I find particularly interesting. It's called The Coddling of the American Mind. And uh, what's interesting about it is in this day of device of left and right, this is one of the few books I have read that really straddles those worlds well and tries to explain what's happening, what the, what the big cultural shift is right now happening, particularly with younger people. It's hitting college campuses uh, hard right now. And it's coming to a church near you, I'm sure. It's a really awesome book. It's by Lukanyov, and I believe his last name is pronounced Hate or Hade. And uh, look for that book, The Coddling of the American Mind. I think you'll enjoy it. I know I have. Great. We'll pick that book up, folks. Hopefully, it will provoke some thinking. And uh, if you've not been a part of the Perspectives Study Program, do that as well. It will also provoke you to think biblically and well about missions. James, thanks for being with us today. Thank God you. It's my others. privilege. Thanks. Our bless. Before you go, would you visit our host's websites? There you will find a wealth of interesting and challenging information about the state of the Great Commission. They are 1615.org and missionexus.org. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss one. Thanks again to our sponsor, Support Raising Solutions. Make sure to check out their website at supportraisingsolutions.org. The Mission Matters is presented through a partnership between 1615 Missions Coaching and Missio Nexus.